Hello, and welcome to Constitution Day at Brooklyn Law School. For those of you whom I haven't met, I'm Interim Dean Mary Ellen Fullerton, and I have the pleasure of introducing the panel uh, we have assembled today of four of our esteemed constitutional law faculty members uh, to talk about various things related to the Constitution. Um, I wanted to take a moment before they take uh, over uh, and tell you a little bit about Constitution Day, uh, which is observed on September 17th, the day that in 1787, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention signed the convention in Philadelphia. And in 2004, fast forward a couple hundred years, uh, Congress established this day, Constitution Day, and mandated that federal agencies and federally funded schools should provide educational program on the U.S. Constitution every year on this date. 2005, the Department of Education extended that uh, and said every school receiving any kind of federal funds at all uh, had to uh, have some kind of program on the Constitution on Constitution Day. So I thought that was kind of an interesting background. And then there's a little bit more. Uh, when Congress did this in 2004, what they hijacked was Citizenship Day. Uh, and uh, Citizenship Day had been on September 17th, uh, celebrated uh, for um, essentially about 50 years. Uh, and it was supposed to celebrate those who had become part of the United States polity. Uh, so here we are, it's officially now called Constitution Day and Citizenship Day, but maybe in the sign of the times, the citizenship part seems to get dropped out of the label. Um, one last little uh, bit of factoid uh, that I wanted to share with you. The way Citizenship Day came about actually has a New York origin. In the 1939 New York World's Fair, there was a hit song called I Am an American. Uh, and one of the New York newspapers, we're gonna talk about the importance of the press here today, uh, one of the New York newspapers <coughs> made it uh, a, an advocacy piece to have a, a citywide holiday of celebrating I Am American. William Randolph Hearst picked this up and had a nationwide uh, campaign uh, to establish a citizenship day in the late 1930s and early 1940, and Congress then followed suit with citizenship day. So maybe it began in Philadelphia or maybe it began here in New York, uh, but in, in either case, we're here today to talk about the United States Constitution, uh, and we're gonna talk about various aspects of it. Uh, we're gonna start with Professor Alice Ristroff in the middle, uh, who is going to discuss the process that the Constitution provides for selection of Supreme Court justices. Uh, and then, uh, after she gives a very brief uh, overview of that, we're going to turn to the likely impact that Justice Kennedy's departure will have on several different areas of jurisprudence, uh, with Professor Susan Herman speaking first about the area of reproductive freedom. Uh, Pro Professor Bill Ariza, closest to me, speaking then uh, with regard to the impact in equality uh, jurisprudence and uh, ending the faculty portion of this with Professor Joel Gora on the far end of the panel talking about the realm of the free press and free speech more broadly. So uh, if I could turn it over to you, Alice. Thanks very much, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I hope you are here because you want to be and not because in any way you feel like you have to be. Um, I just want to follow up quickly on one of the things Dean Fullerton said about Constitution Day. Because Congress has conditioned receipt of federal funds on having a Constitution Day event, this has led some snarky and cheeky um, legal whiz, um, uh, 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 legal commentators to say um, that there's at least a question about whether Constitution Day is itself constitutional <laughs> because the federal government is not supposed to be conditioning money to um, uh, states or subsidiary institutions on a particular message or teaching a particular educational program. 
Um, it's, a, it's a novel argument. Um, it's not necessarily one I subscribe to because I don't think that at a Constitution Day event there's any rule about what we say about the Constitution and whether we celebrate it or criticize it or wish that it said something different. Um, I think um, we, can, uh, we can be open about it and I hope that you will have some questions um, either about constitution or constitutional doctrine or more specifically about the Supreme Court nomination process um, for us to talk about. Um, I also just want to say um, I had thought a little bit about what I wanted to say about the composition of the Supreme Court and how the people that are on it get there. Um, I had thought about that in the Friday, Saturday of last week and we're in a rapidly changing world in which, um, of course, new, um, new revelations yesterday um, about um, the identity of the person who has raised questions about, about uh, Brett Kavanaugh's uh, qualifications to be on the court. Um, uh, I, uh, those, that latest news was sort of not in my mind when I was thinking about these comments. Um, and I think that it is, again, sort of fair game and something to ask about or talk about if any of you want to raise questions um, uh, in our question period. But to make sure that we do have time for questions, let me um, get started with um, what I wanted to say was really um, to sort of highlight some of the ways in which the Constitution does provide some kinds of continuity. Because our topic for the day is the Supreme Court at a crossroads, which I think is a, you know, sort of a, a good thing to think about at a moment at which the composition of the court is changing. And when we think about the Supreme Court changing, one of the questions that arises that my, my uh, fellow panelists will address is, um, well, how might the doctrine change? How might constitutional law itself change if you have a different mix of people interpreting it? Um, and so um, in a kind of time of a lot of topsy-turviness and new stories breaking and an, in a time of a lot of change and looking forward at a lot of potential constitutional change, um, I want to note that there are some ways in which the Constitution does operate as the 39 men who signed that document 231 years ago envisioned. There are some ways in which the document itself kind of provides some kind of continuity and stability. There are some aspects of the Constitution that I think are, are very hard to change, even if, say, you wanted to change them. Um, and so I, I just wanted to, I mean, this will be sort of a reminder for people who have already taken con law, a preview for people who are going to take a constitutional law course. Um, I just want to point out that um, some of the specific provisions in that original document have changed very little, if at all, and are unlikely to change. The document that was signed 231 years ago didn't have any amendments to it. It was the original Constitution. It consisted of a bunch of articles establishing and empowering a federal government, saying this is how the federal government is going to look, these are the powers it has, here's how that power is distributed. Um, you probably know or have heard of an Article I that establishes uh, a Congress, gives legislative powers to that Congress, um, and uh, defines the composition of the Senate and the House of Representatives. That provision of the Constitution, like many, many others, is itself, was itself the product of negotiations and compromises. Um, debates about how much the federal government should respond to, should be representative of individual citizens versus representing states as equal entities. And of course the Senate is the part of Congress that is supposed to represent the states as equal entities. Every state gets two senators, doesn't matter how many people live in the state. And the House of Representatives is somewhat more popular in the sense of um, representing states on the basis of, of population. Um, and that, that compromise between strict popular representation in the House and equal representation for the states in the Senate, that has endured and, you know, occasionally you'll see sort of uh, 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 very innovative, um, let me say, um, proposals to reform the Senate or to change the way Congress is structured, but I don't think they get much traction. Um, so that basic um, uh, uh, allocation of power is lasting and enduring. And similarly, when we think about something like the presidency, Article 2 of the, that document signed 231 years ago, um, 
you know that um, the president is elected not by popular vote, but by an electoral college, and the members of that electoral college are sort of assigned among the states in a way that reflects membership in Congress. Um, we know also Article 3 um, of the document uh, that was signed on this day in 1787 um, provides for a federal judiciary, including a Supreme Court. And um, importantly, um, the Article 2 on the president gives the president the power to appoint those justices um, subject to the advice and consent of the Senate. Um, so there are important ways in which the federal government that was envisioned and created 231 years ago um, is, design, is by design not a strictly populist <coughs> institution, but um, not one that just sort of reflects what the people across the country want in a kind of most uh, um, uh, direct representation way, but rather um, the federal government is designed in many ways to be responsive to states. Um, and I just want to, to think about that with respect to the last three people nominated to, um, to the Supreme Court, because I think it's an illustration of, again, about how some of the provisions of the Constitution don't change and are unlikely to change. So when Judge Merrick Garland was nominated by former President Obama um, after um, Justice Scalia died, um, Oh, President Obama had the power under the Constitution to make that nomination, um, but as you probably remember, the Senate refused to consider the nomination. Um, and because the Constitution itself requires Senate confirmation or advice and consent of the Senate, the Garland nomination withered and, and, went, um, and went nowhere. Um, as you know, um, I, before, um, before that seat on the Supreme Court was filled, um, a new president was selected by the Electoral College, um, President Trump, and, um, and then once in office, President Trump nominated Neil Gorsuch, now with a Senate that was willing to give advice and consent on that, recommend, on that nomination and, and to confirm him. Now somebody will replace um, Kennedy. I, to be honest, again, don't want to hazard guesses on whether it's um, Brett Kavanaugh or somebody else, um, but I think that the, um, we we can, whoever it is that's going to fill that spot, we can be confident that it is someone who's going to go through that particular process envisioned by the Constitution, a presidential nomination and a Senate, um, uh, um, a Senate confirmation. Um, and I, I just want to kind of begin our discussions with that reminder, again, because it's a time at which we can sort of contemplate a lot of change to constitutional doctrine, a lot of fluctuations, changes on the Supreme Court. Uh, there are some points of continuity, and I think that it's important to remember those as well. Again, whether the ways and whether those points of continuity are to be celebrated or not celebrated, I think you're free to take either position on Constitution Day. Thanks. Okay, um, so one of the areas that people have been watching most in terms of the Kavanaugh hearings is the future of Roe v. Wade. When Brett Kavanaugh had his confirmation hearings for the appellate judgeship, which he currently holds, he told the Senate that he would not uh, want to overrule Roe v. Wade because it was settled law. But it's one thing to say that as an appellate court judge where you don't really have a choice. You have to follow what the Supreme Court says. It's another thing if you're on the Supreme Court and have the power to vote to overrule Roe v. Wade. Now, the justice who um, Kavanaugh would be replacing, although this week it seems a little shakier than it did last week, or you know, whoever else uh, you know, Trump might nominate, uh, would be replacing Anthony Kennedy, uh, who was this, in fact, the swing vote. He's the reason that we still have any of Roe v. Wade left, but he's also the reason why we don't have that much of Roe v. Wade left. So in talking about the future of Roe v. Wade, I want to start with the, the past, you know, pre-Roe v. Wade. And uh, footnote number one, if you want to know more about this, a lot of my historical account is from a book by Linda Greenhouse and Reva Siegel called Before Roe v. Wade. And in 1970, uh, the polling was that most of the people in the country were really quite pro-choice. Uh, Two-thirds of Republicans in 1972 supported the idea that a woman should have the right to have an abortion. 56% of Catholics agreed with that. <clears throat> so in 1970, a number of states began you know, liberalizing abortion and decriminalizing it. Hawaii started. In 1970, the New York legislature took abortion. You know, they decriminalized abortion as long as it was performed within the first 24 weeks. 
However, this trend to liberalization in the states, some, some states did that, but that had, had sort of slowed, and there were a lot of states like Texas that were not doing anything to liberalize abortion. Plus, the Catholic opposition seemed to be hardening. And according to what um, Greenhouse and Siegel had to say, it was the Republican Party that decided that they had an opportunity to win Catholics away from the Democrats and get them to start voting Republican by featuring abortion as an issue that they would do something about. So starting with the 1972 election, the Republicans were campaigning on, we're going to get Roe v. Wade overruled. Well, so uh, 1973, again, that background of uh, the, the support for Roe v. Wade at that time, the Supreme Court's vote was seven to two in Roe v. Wade, and they held, of course, that women should have a right to decide to have an abortion, at least pre-viability, without that many conditions or limitations being put on that. Now, over time, there was a lot of attrition to the Roe v. Wade majority, because you know, first of all, um, some people have suggested that Justice Berger, Chief Justice Berger, who actually joined the majority, only joined the majority for the tactical reason that he wanted to have the power to appoint Harry Blackman to write the opinion instead of William Brennan. And the next case, he started dissenting. He clearly never liked the right to an abortion. So the cases became six to three, then they became five to four, then they became sort of four and a half to four and a half. As the states began to fight back against Roe v. Wade, the point of the dissent was that the states should have their own choices about what to do. And Roe v. Wade, of course, nationalized the law to some extent and limited the state's choices. So after Roe v. Wade, the states came up with things like parental consent laws and waiting provisions and all different kinds of ways to limit the right to have an abortion. Um, Ronald Reagan appointed three justices to the Supreme Court, and one feature of his nominations was people who he thought were going to vote to overrule Roe Ro v. Wade. His appointees were Antonin Scalia, he was right about that one, Sandra Day O'Connor, who he was wrong about, and Anthony Kennedy, who he was also wrong about. So with those three justices <coughs> having come on the court, and then with um, uh, senior President Bush's appointees of uh, Justice Thomas and Justice Souter, everybody predicted that the Supreme Court was going to be overruling Roe v. Wade. Now that prediction proved wrong then. And I think that the prediction that even if Brett Kavanaugh became a Supreme Court justice, he would vote to overrule Roe v. Wade, I think that may turn out not to be true also. So O'Connor, Kennedy, and Souter very much surprised the, the presidents who had appointed them by voting to uphold what they called the essential core of Roe v. Wade in the 1992 case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Pennsylvania had all sorts of limits on abortion a waiting period, informed consent, you know, just a spousal notification provision, just you know, trying to make it really hard. You know, if we can't say it's a crime, what's the next closest we can come? Well, what the Supreme Court did was they looked at all those regulations and they formulated a new test that said, okay, women should, the essential core of Roe v. Wade is that women should, still should be allowed to choose to have an abortion pre-viability. There always has to be a health exception to abortion regulations, even after viability, if a woman's health would be damaged and she needs to have an abortion for medical reasons. Um, in addition, there will be some judicial review of all these state limitations, but in the kind of diluted form of an undue burden test. So applying that test in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, the Supreme Court upheld a number of Pennsylvania's res restrictions and limitations and struck down, one, the spousal notification provision. So that, of course, just opened the door to states to think of more and more different ways to come up with limitations on abortion. Um, one of the big cases where Justice Kennedy you know, kind of swung the other way is a case called Gonzalez versus Carhartt in 2007. And in that case, for the first time, the Supreme Court looked at abortion methodology. And in that case, they looked at the technique of abortion, a uh, you know, form of dilation and extraction that was used uh, mostly in the, the, for late-term abortions. And the Supreme Court held that Congress, the federal government, had a right to criminalize that particular method of abortion because it was too gruesome. Now, in his opinion, Justice Kennedy writes what really looks like an anti-abortion opinion. He's totally contemptuous of women and how they're going to be sorry and they're going to make mistakes. He talks about abortion doctors. And he describes abortion in such gruesome terms that a lot of people, including the dissenters, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and others, said, well, you know, if you think that Congress can criminalize this particular method of abortion because it's so gruesome. What about you know, the standard technique that's used during the second trimester, dilation and, and extraction? Well, you know, nobody talked about that. But Gonzalez versus Carhartt was another five to four decision. That's Justice Kennedy. 
Around 1995, between Planned Parenthood versus Casey and um, Gonzalez versus Carhart, while all the states are coming up with all these limitations, the polling had shifted, and at that point, 56% of people uh, t described themselves as pro-choice, and 33% described themselves as pro-life. So that's you know, down from two-thirds. Well, since 2010, things have really heated up. Since 2010, there have been 423 state laws restricting or limiting abortion in some ways. The most recent Supreme Court case on that subject of how far can the states go in restricting abortion or just making things tough uh, is a case called Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt. And this deals with what people sometimes call trap regulations, targeting regu target regulating abortion providers. Now, the states, in addition to regulating the methodology of abortion and the limitations, do you have to have a waiting period, an informed consent period, et cetera, they started coming up with all these regulations. If you're going to have a facility that offers abortions, you have to have, you know, doctors admitted, the hallways have to be X, Y, you have to have parking lots that hold. And most of these provisions looked ridiculous. The myth there is that abortion is really dangerous and that they were doing this on behalf of women's health. But all the experts will tell you abortion is a very safe procedure. And these, you know, this is like you know, the voter suppression laws. They were only doing it to shut down abortion clinics. And the combination of these measures, the regulations that you know, if abortion clinics couldn't meet these standards, they would have to close, had been very successful. We have now six states that are down to only one clinic in the entire state that is willing to perform abortions. Not only in the South, it's Kentucky, Mississippi, North Dakota, South Dakota, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Well, um, after 2010, lately, it's as if you know, the states are beginning to really smell blood, you know, especially once Donald Trump is elected. People are seeing that maybe once again, we will have Supreme Court nominees <coughs> who would be willing to overrule Roe v. Wade. So a lot of states have been passing laws to give the Supreme Court an opportunity to overrule Roe v. Wade by passing all sorts of laws that either arguably or downright blatantly violate everything the Supreme Court provided in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. I'll give you a couple of examples of the 14 cases that are now pending in the courts of appeals that really challenge Roe v. Wade and could su supply the Supreme Court with the first opportunity to decide whether to adhere to Roe v. Wade. Alabama has passed a law picking up on the um, Gonzalez versus Carhartt idea and banning the most common tri second trimester procedure, dilation and ev evacuation. The 11th Circuit has felt held that that is inconsistent with current law. They've struck it down. There are five other states where similar laws were passed, which are currently blocked by the courts, by judicial review. But if the Alabama case were the first one to get up to the Supreme Court, that's a big question. If the Supreme Court says, yes, Alabama can prohibit the most common technique used for abortion, then, you know, basically game over in Alabama. Arkansas had a different idea about what technique to prohibit, and they have prohibited abortion by medication another very common method of abortion. Uh, so the 11th Circuit struck down the Alabama law, but the 5th and 8th Circuits have been upholding a lot of these really stringent limitations by the states. Um, a couple of other examples. So um, there are other, a couple of states that are also wanting to push back the via, on the viability lines. So and Mississippi now has a law that prohibits abortion after 15 weeks, considerably before viability. Iowa has a law that prohibits abortion once a fetal heartbeat can be detected, considerably pre-viability. Um, and Kentucky has, you know, the, another thing that uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey allowed for was attempts uh, that the state makes to try to dissuade women from having abortions. So what Kentucky now requires is that if you want to have an abortion, you have to have an ultrasound and then you have to sit while somebody looks at the ultrasound with you and describes it and points things out and tells you about your baby. So, you know, those are things that are going on in all of the states. Now, again, I think that you know, in the same way that Justices O'Connor, Kennedy, and Souter never really decided what they thought about Roe v. Wade because they decided that they believed in stare decisis. It is possible that a Brett Kavanaugh or somebody else on the Supreme Court might follow that and might agree you know, not to overrule Roe v. Wade, which is settled law, which would give it to the states to do whatever they want, including all this extreme criminalization. Uh, but I think it is predictable that Kavanaugh or any other Trump nominee would continue what Kennedy, among others, have been allowing, which is for the states to make it increasingly difficult so that the opportunity for women, especially women without a lot of money, especially in states like Alabama or Arkansas or Wyoming, is going to basically make things impossible. <coughs> 
So if Roe v. Wade were overruled, or even if it's not, even if states are allowed to just make it really, really difficult to get an abortion, what that means is that we're back to state by state by state. So during the Q&A, if you want to know, I can tell you what's happening in New York, because the New York Civil Liberties Union is working to try to get legislation to replace the 1970 legislation. At, in 1970, it was very liberal legislation. But <coughs> since Roe v. Wade, the New York um, pr provision only allows for abortion up to 24 weeks. So actually, doctors could be criminalized after that. So there is a move to try to um, beef up the New York legislation, which Governor Cuomo supports, so that if Roe v. Wade were to be overruled, women in New York would be protected. Of course, that means that if you're a woman of childbearing age, you don't want to be living in Alabama. So you know, once again, it would be state by state. The final footnote I want to give you is that if you want to know anything more about abortion laws, anything that's going on around the country, there's an excellent website, very reliable, but run by the Guttmacher Institute, G-U-T-T-M-A-C-H-E-R. So anything you want to know, you can find there. OK, so you can, during uh, Q&A, you can let me know if you want to know about New York or anything more. OK. Um, so good afternoon. I'm going to be speaking about the uh, Supreme Court and equality law. And I'd like to start by actually asking uh, for a show of hands of how many people have had con law here. Okay, so <laughs> most of you have, not all of you have. So I'll try to tone my, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad Dean Fullerton, you've had con law. <laughs> they may have forgotten. I feel much better now. <laughs> so I'll try to, I'll try to cast my, my comments at the, at the appropriate level. So in, in, at least in terms of equality law, this may not be the case with other areas of constitutional law, but at least with the case of equality law, um, we, uh, assuming that Brett Kavanaugh gets confirmed or that someone like him eventually becomes confirmed, uh, what we face, what, what the country faces is the following prospect. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts is the median at the court. He's the center of the court. And so when we think about what is in store for equality law uh, at the court, we need to think about a court in which John Roberts is at the center. Um, so um, I'm going to begin sort of at the, at, at the highest level, uh, talking about affirmative action and race, and then get down to the most granular level uh, with talking about statutory equality law if there's time. So I'll begin by talking about race, and I'll really just short, you know, just kind of give you the punchline to start with. Um, affirmative action is, uh, I don't want to say doomed. Um, affirmative action is in serious uh, trouble at the court, at least race-based affirmative action in higher education. Um, it has been hanging by a thread for the last 15 years, ever since the Grutter case in 2003. Uh, in Grutter, it was Justice O'Connor who was the crucial fifth vote for upholding the University of Michigan Law School's affirmative action plan. Uh, and after Justice O'Connor's departure, Justice Kennedy uh, became the center of the court. He dissented in Grutter, um, but then after, after O'Connor leaves, you see him, I think, self-consciously try to become the middle of the court on affirmative action. And so in a case called Parents Involved, from I believe 2007, um, he concurs with the, with the majority opinion, striking down race-based student assignments in primary education, not university, but basically kids. Um, but he writes in a, a concurring opinion that tries to find some room for states to, uh, to take account of race when making assignment decisions for students of that age. Um, the focus shifted back to universities um, in, two, um, in 2013 uh, when the court decides the first of two cases called the University of Texas versus Fisher. Uh, Fisher was the disappointed white applicant who had, uh, to UT who sues when she uh, uh, um, uh, who sues to challenge the state's uh, the school's race-based affirmative action plan. Um, in Fisher 1, the first of the two opinions the court writes in 2013, uh, Justice Kennedy, writing for the court, concludes that, uh, that the Fifth Circuit had simply applied the wrong standard uh, in evaluating the Texas plan. And a lot of race-based affirmative action really <coughs> comes down to not what the standard is, the, the technical legal formula. Everyone concedes it's strict scrutiny, but rather what strict scrutiny actually means. Now, Fisher 1 was a relatively easy case in that the Fifth Circuit probably, and there's room for disagreement, but probably had in fact applied a standard that was uh, more deferential than indicated by the, by the Supreme Court's precedent. And in fact, Fisher 1 was not a five to four, it was like a six to three, six to two with one justice not participating. So uh, that was a fairly easy case. On the other hand, uh, Fisher two, coming back to the court three years later in 2016, was a very closely divided case. It was four to three 
By that time, Justice Scalia had passed away. Justice Kagan didn't participate in any of the Fisher litigation, I believe because uh, the uh, SG might have taken a position on this while she was uh, still, in the, uh, still in, the, in the Clinton White House, I believe, or, may, or maybe the Obama White House. Um, so uh, what, uh, what the court does in Fisher too, on this four to three very closely decided vote, Kennedy writing for the majority is to conclude that in fact the Texas plan does satisfy strict scrutiny. So Justice Kennedy again very much at the knife's edge of which plans satisfy with strict scrutiny and which plans don't. You saw that in Parents Involved, you see that in Fisher too, and with his departure it's hard to see how any Trump-nominated uh, justice would uh, carry forward that approach. I, I, I've got to believe, and I think Justice, Judge Kavanaugh himself, I think, has made this fairly clear, if he becomes the one, that uh, he would, in fact, take a harder line with regard to race-based affirmative action. And so uh, I think the real interesting action on affirmative action, uh, assuming that Justice Kavanaugh will, in fact, be the constitutionality, not of explicitly race-based plans, but of plans that are ostensibly race neutral, for example, like the top 10% plan in Texas um, that is race neutral, but clearly was designed to increase the enrollment of black and Latino students at UT, and query whether a, uh, uh, a more hostile Supreme Court, hostile to affirmative action, query whether that court would uh, be skeptical uh, of that sort of under the table use of race. It would be an ironic result for reasons we can talk about, but I think I'll just leave that discussion uh, now. Um, other constitutional equality claims, um, sex, uh, sex equality. My sense is that I don't think sex equality is going to suffer the kind of retrogression that race equality uh, is going to suffer. Um, the, court seem, the, the majority of the court seems pretty much to have signed on to the sex equality agenda. I think the only thing that conceivably could happen uh, would be maybe some reluctance to adopt maybe more nuanced or more aggressive theories of sex equality. And we can talk about that in the Q&A. But I think just in terms of a straight up sex line and whether such a sex line could, set, could survive at the Supreme Court, my sense is that this court, regardless of whether it's Ju Justice Kavanaugh or somebody else in that final nine seat, would in fact be uh, skeptical uh, about further sex classifications. Uh, sexual orientation presents an interesting question. I think um, uh, I have had conversations with my colleagues where I have expressed doubt that Obergefell would be overruled. Um, and I just don't see Chief Justice Roberts saying that the reliance interests engendered by Obergefell just aren't that big a deal, and therefore it's okay to overrule. Um, that's just my own guess, and we'll, we'll just have to see. On the other hand, I certainly don't see any progress towards formally elevating sexual orientation to fully, you know, full-blown suspect or quasi-suspect class status. I just don't see that happening either. Um, trans equality is a really interesting question that I think I want to hold off until the very end and sort of segue that into a really quick discussion of, uh, uh, of statutory equality. So really just a moment, uh, just a minute on animus because uh, animus and animus theory, animus doctrine has sort of become or was Justice Kennedy's favorite equality tool toward the end of his time on the court and that's what he used in cases like Romer and Windsor to, uh, 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 to rule for sexual orient <clears throat> sorry, for gay and lesbian plaintiffs <clears throat> without having to elevate sexual orientation to full-blown suspect class status. Um, Animus has always been sort of a compromised position at the court, my sense is. And I think it's a really interesting question whether animus doctrine will survive uh, after Justice Kennedy's departure. Personally, I think animus is a really useful thing. It's a really useful concept. If you want to know why, just read my book. Uh, but we can talk about that in Q&A. But as a matter of just prediction, um, I think there's a real possibility that animus is in fact going to drop from the scene, kind of ironically exactly when it's becoming, it, it became last term, much more prevalent, not just in sexual orientation or not just in equality cases in generally, but in Masterpiece Cake Shop, right, the cake case in Colorado, in the travel ban case, animus is really front and center. Query whether that's going to survive. Last minute, I swear, uh, let me talk a little bit about statutory civil rights, because this is actually pretty <coughs> awfully important. Um, Justice Kennedy, in some ways, was not the center of the court, but in some ways he was. So in 2015, he wrote an opinion for himself and the four liberals in a case called 
inclusive communities, um, which is basically a case that asks the following question. Under the Fair Housing Act, or at least one provision of the Fair Housing Act, uh, does the plaintiff need to show uh, discriminatory intent, as is the case under the 14th Amendment, as you know if you've had con law, or does it simply require disparate impact? And Justice Kennedy, to the surprise of a lot of people, said no, disparate impact is all the plaintiff has to show. Uh, whether a Justice Kavanaugh or someone else who might stand in his stead uh, would take that same position is an interesting question. My suspicion is that it's not a hard question because I suspect that uh, a replacement for Kennedy would in fact not be as favorable toward disparate impact liability who instead would insist on discriminatory intent. The last thing I'll say, that takes me back to the question of trans, is Title VII. Uh, the employment discrimination provisions of the, title of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Two basic questions. Number one, does sexual orientation count as sex discrimination, thereby being a, uh, being a violation of Title VII. There's a circuit split on this question. I think Justice Kennedy might well have concluded uh, that it does constitute sex discrimination uh, for reasons we can talk about during the Q&A. I think there was an interesting doctrinal path for him there. Um, I, I, I'm not optimistic about any successor, although, of course, we don't really know. Uh, and finally, another interesting question that I'll conclude with um, is trans discrimination discrimination on the basis of sex in violation of Title VII. And uh, ironically, one might think that that poses an easier, more plaintiff favorable answer for the court. On, uh, because it's, it may be one thing to say, yeah, sexual orientation really isn't the same thing as sex. It's a much harder thing to say, yeah, transgender status is not really the same thing as sex. It kind of almost is by definition. And so it's really interesting to consider whether trans Title VII plaintiffs will in fact win at the court before gay lesbian plaintiffs will. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Joel Gora. I'm an, another member of the Con Law faculty, and it's always an honor and a privilege to participate in uh, celebrating the birthday of our Constitution 200, 231 years ago today. And uh, in preparing for our program today, I pulled out of my pocket copy of the Constitution, and um, I, f I looked at, at the end of it, and this was where they launched what they had just done. Uh, Article 7 says, the ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states, so ratifying the same. Done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present, the 17th day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1787, um, uh, we, got, we got the Lord in, and, um, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 12th. In witness thereof, we are, sign our names. And I've, I've seen uh, people who've gotten appointments from the president of the federal government often have the same boilerplate language, that the appointment is made in the, uh, the year of our Lord so-and-so and the year of uh, America something else. Um, secondly, uh, the signatories were by states. And it turned out New York only had one signatory. And I'm about to give you something that will help you if you're ever on Jeopardy. Um, <laughs> the name of that one signatory became very prominent uh, as a Broadway musical a couple of years ago. Uh, <laughs> indeed, Alexander Hamilton, uh, the only uh, New Yorker who signed it. Um, so um, you'll be all set for Jeopardy. And then finally, um, since I'm going to talk about the First Amendment, um, I, I, rem I was reminded that uh, the First Amendment was actually the Third Amendment. What happened was the Congress, the deal was they, they had a big fight when they were working on the Constitution. Would they um, uh, include a Bill of Rights or not? And the argument on one side was, well, we've, we've so limited the power of the federal government, we haven't empowered them. We haven't given them, in effect, jurisdiction to violate our rights. So we don't need to say that we have those rights. And if we do say we have them, we're sort of admitting that they have the power to take them away and we need to explicitly safeguard them. Uh, and, and the other side was no, no constitution without a Bill of Rights. And that was quite a loggerhead that could have uh, canceled the whole project. So they agreed that they would adopt the constitution without the Bill of Rights, but the first thing they would do when the Congress, the, the, the new Congress convened, was to work on and propose a Bill of Rights. And that's what they did. Uh, but there, there, were, there were 12 proposals. Um, there were two, one of them was for, um, uh, something about uh, congressional representation, how many uh, people would each district have, and the other was about um, congressional pay. And uh, those were set out with the First Amendment and everything else, and those failed. The states didn't ratify those. Uh, and so uh, 
the First Amendment is now first, not third, which is good because um, I've always been taught that um, uh, uh, we should think of the firstness of the First Amendment. So I'll share it with you, it's not very long. Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Uh, all of those wonderful myriad protections are basically designed, I think, to guarantee as much as possible uh, political freedom and religious freedom, or in the order they put it, religious freedom and political freedom. And, uh, and of course, we've been uh, dealing with um, uh, those issues uh, ever since. Um, because of Marbury versus Madison, those of you that have had con law remember, the court is pivotal uh, to how we interpret and apply the Constitution, <clears throat> and certainly um, the First Amendment. And um, in different uh, times in the last hundred years, uh, based on who the justices were and what points of view they had and how they read precedent and how they read history, um, uh, we had different interpretations of the Constitution. Um, in an article I wrote proudly for our Journal of Law and Policy about a year or two ago uh, called Free Speech Matters, the Roberts Court and the First Amendment, I said the Roberts Court is, the, has, is perhaps the most speech protective court we've had in a generation, maybe ever, uh, in terms of the, um, the quality of their uh, concern with uh, protecting the rights in the First Amendment, particularly the rights of political expression. <clears throat> and. Um, in the interest of time, I won't uh, go into great detail, but the basic theme is that the First Amendment was designed to make sure that we, the people, not the government, decide what we want to say and how we want to say it and what we want to hear. Uh, not only about uh, things having to do with politics, but things having to do with life generally, both uh, uh, political and, and cultural matters. And uh, the Roberts Court, in a series of cases, has um, uh, implemented that basic core principle uh, that anti-censorship principle, that uh, the First Amendment is designed to protect against government censorship. Um, of course, a very well-known case, uh, often controversial, that did that uh, was uh, Citizens United uh, that said the government can't control how much political speech we have in, in challenging or criticizing uh, the government. And in a number of other areas, the court has refused to allow uh, there to be development of new categories of, of communication which is not speech, uh, the government argued for that in a couple of cases. The court said, no, we have a limited number of categories. We're not going to add to that list because we think freedom of speech is so important. If the government tries to control the content of what you say, uh, the court has uh, strict uh, rules against that. It's not, uh, uh, you don't have an absolute right to say anything you want, but um, any government effort to control the content of what you say and what you hear uh, is subject to uh, the strictest kind of scrutiny. <clears throat> and the court's theme is, <clears throat> that again, the purpose of the First Amendment is to make sure that individuals and groups get to choose for themselves what they want to say and what they want to hear, uh, and that the government doesn't make those choices for them. Um, so that's the first point I want to make, that the current Supreme Court has been exceptionally protective of the principles of the First Amendment, particularly um, the freedom of speech. Um, the second point I want to make is really a, a, a uh, sort of a shout out. Um, Justice uh, Kennedy, whose retirement has precipitated the uh, moment we're in now uh, to try to uh, replace him, um, uh, he is a real uh, hero to my, my mind um, uh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, he has written some of the court's most important free speech protective cases, um, most particularly Citizens United, but a number of other ca cases as well. Uh, and number two, as uh, Professor Riza mentioned, um, he has written all four of the, of the landmark uh, gay and lesbian rights cases that the Supreme Court has decided. The, the canon, C-A-N-O-N, of those cases uh, are all opinions by Justice Kennedy. And I sometimes think there's a, 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 an overlap between uh, those two areas, free speech, uh, political freedom, and, uh, and sexual freedom, sexual privacy. And that is the dignity and the concern with individual choice and individual autonomy. And if you read the, the gay and lesbian rights cases and you read cases like Citizens United, as, although the, the similarities might not come to mind immediately, there is the same basic core concern uh, with uh, protecting the dignity and the autonomy and the choices of individuals, both um, how to conduct their public lives and how to conduct their private lives. Um, so uh, his replacement um, is obviously of key importance. Um, uh, 
if it's a person that uh, subscribes to the kinds of uh, uh, views that Justice Kennedy has had on free speech and gay and lesbian rights, uh, then we'll have uh, one um, point of view, uh, uh, one set of decisions uh, following those cases, uh, adhering to those precedents, a person with a different perspective, um, uh, who knows um, what we'll have. Um, the theme of today is um, of crossroads. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in First Amendment, there, I think there's a crossroad, or at least a theoretical, uh, between the uh, pro, very strong protection for free speech that, as I said, I think the Roberts Court has um, embodied. Uh, but there's also been a lot of pushback and criticism of uh, strong protection for free speech. Uh, from uh, people, individuals, justices who feel that uh, so the court has overprotected free speech, uh, that uh, it needs to be more balanced, uh, uh, the government's interests, the government's concerns in restricting speech, and the uh, and the uh, <coughs> the speaker, uh, the group's concerns in in uh, in uttering and issuing speech, and um, uh, so I think, uh, of course, partly depending on who sits on the supreme supreme court, um, we'll see if we continue down the road of of strong protection for free speech, or we'll uh, turn onto another road um, uh, of more balanced uh, concern with um, the government's interests on the one hand and uh, uh, free speech on the other. Uh, for myself, I know which, which road I like to be on, and I hope the Supreme Court will stay on that path. Thank you. Thank you all very much uh, for saying a lot in a very short period of time. And I know you have much more to say, but we'd like to hear from you in the audience, and particularly students. Um, if you have a question, uh, would you raise your hand? And uh, I'm sure the panelists would love to have a chance to respond to you. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last thing you asked. Without actually what? Uh, <laughs> well, I think um, I'll uh, take it first. I think it's partly a, re a response to things I said. Um, I think this court has made it clear, and, and, and based on precedents going back a long time and subscribed to by judges across the political spectrum, that uh, uh, the government has the narrowest range uh, of authority to restrict in incitement of violence or hate speech. Um, and we're going back to decisions of the, the, the uh, uh, liberal Warren Court in the 1960s and 70s, which set those benchmarks. And so I think to the extent the current court is protecting those rights and, and limiting the government's ability to control hate speech or to control incitement of violence or law violation, it's really reaching, the court is reaching back to precedents that had the, the support of uh, uh, both liberal and conservative judges. I mean, I think, <clears throat> I, I was an ACLU lawyer for a long time and one of the things that we thought then, and I still believe it now, is that First Amendment rights have to be indivisible and universal. And they, if they're not available to some, they won't be available to anybody. And I think, that's been a common theme, uh, and, and I, I think it would continue today. Yeah, I, I, I associate myself with all those uh, answers. Uh, I, I, doctrinally, the, the idea that incitement is a very, very narrow category of unprotected speech, that idea is so deeply ingrained in the law now that it's hard to see it being pulled up by its roots. Um, it, it, despite challenges, like challenges, for example, of the internet, Right, uh, and also, frankly, challenges of what happens in streets nowadays, which maybe every generation thinks what's happening on the streets is just an outrage that's never happened before, but I happen to think that a lot of what's going on in the streets is an out outrage that's never happened before. I don't think that's a legal challenge, frankly, as much as it is a policing challenge. Okay, other questions? Yes. Even if not politically, but the population is seeming to move 
well, I don't want to say to the left, but it's trending in that direction. What would you say is the likelihood of that, and what would be a potential solution? Can I take that? Sure. I mean, um, I think that's a possibility. What you identify as a possibility. That's part of what um, I wanted to suggest about sort of thinking about whether some of the enduring aspects of the Constitution are something to be celebrated. Are they something that we might, you know, be less comfortable with now than we were 231 years ago? Um, I mean, I, do, I think it's unquestionably the case that the federal government is designed not to um, sort of represent each individual citizen of the nation person by person individually um, because of, again, an array of compromises and um, I think, you know, there are good arguments for some of those compromises. Um, but the federal government do just doesn't. The president doesn't. Um, the Senate certainly doesn't. Um, the House of Representatives, maybe more so, but again, it's just one piece of it. Um, and so we could be, um, you know, just with population growth and changes in the country, I mean, you can sort of imagine a country in which the growth in population is greatest in coastal states and presently blue states on those electoral maps. And um, in which the, you know, the very structure of the governmental design um, secures a sort of um, lasting um, and proportionally greater over time power for states with low or declining populations. Um, whether, how that affects the long run legitimacy of the court, I mean, I think part of it is, um, uh, part of the answer to that question, I think, is just uh, uh, a matter of understanding, do people, understand the way the federal government is designed and the way the Supreme Court is designed. Um, and um, I think that, you know, to the extent that people are, it's all sort of foggy and people are unaware, then I'm not sure that, that these sort of population shifts matters, you know, whether, whether that in and of itself um, affects the perceived legitimacy of, this, of the Supreme Court. But I think that, you know, again, looking, looking down the road, I think, you know, this, this possible gap between the median voter taking everyone across the country as a whole and the institution charged with supreme authority for interpreting the Constitution, a, a possible gap there can exist and I think there's a capacity for it to grow. You know, I think the, just to briefly, um, the check on what you're concerned about, namely the court getting, separating from the views of the majority of the country, uh, are the elections we have on a periodic basis. I mean, if people don't like what Trump has done with the Supreme Court, they don't like what the Republicans have done by stealing the Garland seat, uh, they don't like putting up a guy like uh, Kavanaugh, whatever it may be. You know, a month from now, everybody has every opportunity to express that in voting for members of the House and Senate, and, and you, don't, you won't get instantaneous change, but you'll sure get change over, uh, I think, a shorter term than a longer term. Uh, final point, um, way back when, um, the um, Nick, uh, Nixon and Republicans in the 60s ran against the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court handed down a lot of liberal decisions, particularly criminal justice, criminal de defendants' rights, and um, the Republicans ran on a law and order ticket, and they elected Nixon, and bingo, you got four Supreme Court justices, most of whom started cutting back on criminal defendants' rights. So there is an ultimate governor, and it does reside with us. Just go out and vote. I want to say, I think, you know, your question about legitimacy really is a question of, of politics and whether people regard the Supreme Court as legitimate and want to change what they're doing. But we've had a number of points in our past when the Supreme Court has very much opposed the popular will and dragged us back. You know, we could mention Dred Scott, we could mention the Lochner era, where the Supreme Court kept striking down progressive state laws that helped new workers, etc. We could mention the New Deal where it was only because Franklin Roosevelt was elected president and was able to you know, change the composition of the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court stopped you know, preventing the entire country from doing what everybody, you know, the majority wanted to do in Congress and even in the presidency about getting out of the Depression. So, you know, yes, there are political options, but I personally, I think that the idea of having the Supreme Court veer sharply to the right as well as the hundred new very right-wing judges on the, the f lower federal bench are going to have a tremendous impact for years, and I think it's going to be an anti-popular vote impact. Really quick, I'm just going to add one final thing that hasn't been said yet. Federalism. Um, and I think I can easily see progressives becoming much more enamored of federalism in the next 20 years. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I yeah. have to teach. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> one of our panelists has a class beginning in 10 minutes. Um,
But since we do have a couple more questions, um, I think we will uh, thank her as she leaves. <laughs> and take questions. So. One second. Pardon me, one second. But it's um, sort of luck whether it's a Supreme Court. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I missed your question. I apologize. Term limits. Term limits. Because even though we can elect the president of Congress, term limits for Supreme Court justices? You know, that was the question I was going to ask all of you, what you thought about it. I mean, there are three things. Three things. Three things. One is. Uh, adding new justices, kind of court packing, revisited. Uh, the second is 15 year, 20 year terms. And the third is mandatory retirement at age 75. They have that in the Canadian Supreme Court. They, they're out at 75. Um, you know, I tell you, I, I think if you believe in the, the court as the keeper of the flame, uh, of protecting individual rights and over the long haul, then I think the, I, I like the, the political sensitivity that the court now has through elections and things like that. I'm not sure I, I, I would want to limit the, the amount of time that justices can be on the court, particularly you know, some of the greatest justices have, have been there for a long, long time and, uh, and have that, that perspective. So I know, plus, which I, I think is a practical matter, it's going to be hard to put anything like that through. Uh, uh, you probably have to amend the Constitution at least for some of those proposals. Um, but um, as I said, other countries like Canada have versions of that, and uh, maybe we ought to think about it too. If I could actually add one more comment, which is sort of you know, um, not exactly germane to your question, Robin, but it seems to me that another consequence of Anthony Kennedy's departure is that our democracy is in trouble because Kennedy was the only one who was willing to think about having the Supreme Court review partisan gerrymandering and some of the other things that wreck elections and make elect that distort elections, that enable the incumbents to make sure that nobody else can ever get in and replace them. And he was holding the line. You know, he hadn't gotten around, unfortunately, in, in the partisan gerrymandering cases to coming up with a standard he thought the Supreme Court would apply. But I think if you have another justice who agrees with you know, the Scalia, Gorsuch, et cetera, position, Roberts, the court just will not be in the business and they'll let the states do whatever they want. And that really makes political change much more difficult. Okay, in the very back. Okay, so this question relates to the Me Too movement um, in the post-Epic Systems Court. So in Epic Systems, this past year, the Supreme Court held the arbitration agreements providing for individualized proceedings must be enforced. And one view is that this case was whether, about whether employers should be allowed to force their employees as a condition of continued employment to give up any right to collectively use the legal system to combat wage theft, sexual harassment, or other serious violations of the law. So, and Kavanaugh's record on the DC circuit shows that it's very much for arbitration. So what could a Kavanaugh nomination mean for the Me Too movement and other such movements for vulnerable communities as it pertains to due process and equality in the workplace? Well, I think our friend Justice Kennedy has already struck a serious blow against our, our friends, the workers, in, in the recent case about unions. So, you know, that was one uh, thing that's already happened. Yeah, I, it's an interesting question. I don't know. Do you have any sense of it? Well, I mean, I, I, I think the area of business regulation is one in which the Kennedy to Kavanaugh or Kennedy to whoever switch uh, is not going to have a big impact. But then Justice Kennedy was very much a... Um, uh, with the uh, with the right wing or the right side of the court on uh, on those issues, and a very pro business, as you noted, very pro arbitration, um, and um, I just don't see a big ch I don't see a big potential for uh, for a change there in either direction. All right, uh, if we have no further questions, I think we'll call uh, this panel to a close. But I do want to say. Um, whether it's Citizenship Day or Constitution Day, I think it's the wrong idea to think of one day as Constitution Day. Every day is Constitution Day. Yeah. And will you help me uh, thank the panel for coming?